Okay, so in front of us we have an RTX 2080 Ti. This is the uh, Zotac Gaming, I think. Anyways, like all the broken cars that we get, we want to first start by checking for a short on the base voltage wheels. So I have my multimeter in a continuity mode. If I probe ground or something connected to ground, my multimeter beeps. So, we're going to start by uh, checking 12 volts and 3.3 volts at the PCI Express slot. So, if you don't know, first three pins are 12 volts. And to, to check 3.3 volts, we start this notch and we go four pins left. We're good. Okay, now we want to check a uh, 12 volt at the external 8 pin, so we can just check, um, I think these two inductors, and you know what, we'll, we'll check these three, because I know they're all uh, 12 volts, but which is which, I'm not too sure, so that one's good, good, and good. Yep, okay, so yep, the, we, we don't have a short on 12 volts, that's a nice sign. We, now we want to go over to resistance mode and check the voltage rails generated by the card itself. So to start with, we want to first check uh, 5 volts, since, since it's the first row to turn on. 2.6 uh, mega ohms, that's uh, very high. Now we want to check 1.8 volts. This is 1.8 volts here. Okay, so uh, pushing 6 kilo ohms. Now we want to check the PEX rail. The PEX rail, if you don't know, is over here. So typically for the PEX rail, I expect to see about 6 ohms or so for an RTX 20 series card and 7.8, which is perfectly fine. Since our, and actually, now we want to check the uh, memory. So for the memory, um, you should expect to see about 20 ohms for Samsung and uh, in this case, pushing 50 ohms for, I should, maybe I should say 45, for uh, micron memory. So anyways, that's perfectly good. Now, since the uh, card is not short, let's go ahead and turn it on. Okay, so let's see what voltage rails we have. So first we have, let's see, 5 volts. So not detected, okay. Yep, we have 5 volts. And then we have, uh, let's see, 1.8. We do not. So because we, do not, we don't have 1.8, we won't have the V-core. And because we don't have the V-core, we won't have the PEX. This here, okay. Because we don't have the V-Core, we also won't have the memory. Okay, so our problem is that we're missing 1.8 volts. This is, this is actually surprisingly common for a um, Turing card, actually. It's, uh, it's rather uncommon on a Pascal card to be missing 1.8 volts, but on Turing, it's surprisingly normal. Okay, so for our 1.8 volt buck converter, we want to be checking two things. Okay, we want, well, maybe I should say three. So we want to check voltage in that, we, that it's present. I expect this to be about 12 volts. We want to check uh, P enable of course and then we want to check um, VCC so arbitrarily those are the only three pins that we're going to start with unfortunately I lost one of my video clips so going forward just know that this card had voltage in and VCC but it was missing enable okay so as you can see I've removed both the 1.8 volt and the 5 volt bar converter this is mostly just so I can trace it a little better so before we get into um, the diagnostic let me just explain very briefly how the enable signal for 1.8 volts is generated on these on this particular card and just a lot of RTX 20 series cards in general. So the way it works, and let me just, it, it's best if I show you which components. So the 1.8 volt enable signal, which is pinned to on our GS9216, our link, um, you should use the data sheet for a certain alpha and omega semiconductor part. I'll link it in the description, of course. So pin two, which is enable, maps, if you don't know, to a, another component on the other side of the border. So the component in question is actually a diode. In fact, it's, let me see, it's this diode here. So it has about a 4 ohm connection to this diode, and on the other end of the diode, which is actually the top end, oddly enough, the top end then connects to this, to this logical AND gate. So this logical AND gate is responsible for generating the enable signal for 1.8 volts. If you don't know how a logical AND gate works, it requires three inputs, I should say one power line and two inputs in order to get the uh, gate itself to output anything. So first it has a VCC pin. This is power. VCC in this case is actually derived from input B through a 10 kilo ohm resistor, which I think is maybe it's this one or this one. It's around here. Anyways, so like I said, so VCC is actually generated by the component that generates input B. So input A is power good, or P good, as it's sometimes called, from our 5 volt buck converter. The buck converter, by the way, um, I don't actually know the exact model, but you can use the data sheet for an MP8859. So, that's input A. Input B is derived from a GS71, oh, 7155 buck converter, or LDO, I'm not too sure. Um, I, I can't find a data sheet for this particular, for this particular component, or at least in this package, but I can find it in another package. So after I've done a little bit of mapping, as far as I can tell, pins one, two, and three are the outputs. Pin 
4 or 5 is P good, which is what is uh, input A. Pin 6 is enable, which is typically about 3.3, no, which is P good from the 5 volt buck converter. And pins 7, 8, 9, and 10 constitutes, I think, both voltage in and VCC. I'm not so sure about the VCC part, but I'm definitely sure about voltage in. So like I said, this component generates input B for our logical AND gate over here. And because the input B is bridged through a 10 kilo ohm resistor to VCC, GS7155 also generates VCC for this particular, log particular logical AND gate. So let's check the three input pins. I should say that one power pin and two input pins and see what we have. I should note that the fact that we don't have a 5 volt buck converter installed doesn't affect this particular measurement. So let's first check input A or input 1. As you can see, we have about 580 millivolts. This needs to be about 3.3 volts. Now let's check input two. I can tell you this is actually already gonna be zero. 40 millivolts, no surprise. So because we don't have input two, we definitely won't have VCC either. Since VCC is derived from input two or input B. So yep, six millivolts. The reason why, okay. So the way this, because of how the circuit is wired, if we don't have input A, we won't have input B. And if we don't have input B, we won't have VCC, since input A is used as the enable signal for the component that generates input B. So what we need to do is we need to figure out why we have only 580 or so millivolts on input A instead of the expected 3.3 volts. Now, in this particular case, it's actually quite straightforward. So there's a particular observation that you can make with this particular card if you have at least a very basic understanding of the power rails on a motherboard. So as you saw, when we turned on the card and the motherboard, we had 580 millivolts. Now, let me show you what happens when I turn on the power supply, but not the motherboard. So you heard that click. I turned on the power supply, but I have not turned on the motherboard. You might be able to see the power buttons. Let's see. You may notice that they're off, actually. Yep. Anyways, they're not glowing, so yep, the card is, the uh, motherboard is off. But notice that despite the fact that the motherboard is off, if we measure P good for our 5 volt buck converter, which is also input A, we have 577 millivolts. So like I said, the, the card itself is off. I'm sorry, the motherboard itself is off, and yet we have 580 millivolts. If we turn the card on, sorry, turn the motherboard on, nothing changes. So. This is actually our biggest hint as to what's gone wrong. Now, the reason why this is such a useful hint is because it allows us to use a basic fact about motherboards in general and power supplies, ATX power supplies be specific, to make a determination of what's gone wrong in this card. So, if you don't know, these power supplies, they have a power rail called the 5 volt standby rail. It's a rather unique rail in that it's present when the motherboard is off. So. You know, the regular 12 volt, 3.3 volt, and 5 volt rails, they're only, they're only present on the motherboard after you press the power button. But the 5 volt standby rail is always present. So, the fact that we have 600 millivolts on our, on, at P good while the motherboard is off tells us that our faulty component is connected to these, this uh, 5 volt standby rail. Which also tells us what, that our faulty component must therefore be connected to the PCIe pins. So if you don't know these motherboards, they supply about 3.4 volts on some of these PCIe pins on this side, as well as uh, this side. Okay, so as you can see, we have, we're have we looking at an overhead view of the 2080 Ci, and in particular, the PCIe pins. So on this particular side, there are, I think I think there are only four pins exactly that take 3.3 uh, volts derived from the five volt standby rail. So I have my black probe on ground, by the way. So the four pins that I'm familiar with, at least, are the fifth and sixth pins. This is the SM bus data and clock line. So if we check the fifth pin, open line, checking the sixth pin, again, open line. So the next two pins are actually the very last, the uh, last two pins before the notch. So if we start at this notch and we go left one pin and two pins, those are the last two pins. So checking the very last pin, we have 2.8 volts. Okay, that's fine. And checking the second last pin, we have a short which means that our faulty component that's responsible for, for um, probably bringing uh, P good down on the five volt buck converter is actually connected to the 3.3 volt auxiliary, auxiliary uh, pin, which is the second last pin here. So I'm gonna go hook up my power supply and in a moment you'll see exactly which component was dead. All right. So as you saw, I replaced the component on the back. In particular, I replaced 
this component over here. If you're wondering, despite its shape, it's actually a MOSFET, believe it or not. This is um, similar to an APL 3511A. I don't know the exact parts, but I will, whatever, if I figure it out, I'll link it in the description, or I'll link the APL 3511A in the description. To add to this, if we now check the uh, diode reading at the, at the second last pin where we used to have a short, we have an open line, which is a good sign. And finally, if we put the uh, card in our motherboard, turn on the power supply but not the motherboard and we check the 5 volt P good signal or the first input for our logical AND gate that generates the enable signal for 1.8 volts you'll see we have 0 volts as it should be you know it's not supposed to be 600 millivolts so the card seems to be in a much better state let's plug it in and see if it works okay turning the card on as you can see we have 800 millivolts and better yet we have a BIOS splash screen there we go so all we have left to do is put the card uh, back together with its cooler and stress test it. Alright, so as you can see, the uh, card's running game. It's been running game for about an hour. So if you look at the uh, clock speeds, you'll notice that they uh, are more or less what they should be. 1815 for the core and 1750 for the memory. If you go over to the power consumption, it's about 100% of TDP as expected. And finally, if you look at the graphics, the uh, bus interface, we'll see that it, it's running at X16, as it should be. So. I'm going to go ahead and say that the card is repaired. Uh, I was a little bit surprised, you know, I don't get to too many opportunities to use the actual PCIe pins to diagnose the card, but in this case, you know, it was a nice, easy, straightforward uh, repair. Also, if you want to support the channel, I should note that I now have a Patreon, actually. It's linked in the description, so I have donation tiers between $1 and $50. So if you have the money to spare, and only if you have the money to spare, consider sending a donation or becoming a patron, it would definitely help out. Otherwise, I hope you learned something watching this video, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.